All right, well, what's up guys and welcome back to Fab Unofficial. We got a lot to talk about. Okay, first of all, uh, world premiere just happened last weekend and it looked like the sickest event. And we finally got to see um, all the cards in Rosetta. Uh, and man, I don't even know where to start. Um, in this video, uh, I'm gonna touch on some of the things that were you know, we found out this weekend there were plenty. Um, and then I am going to do a little bit of a deep dive. I say deep dive, a little bit of a shallow dive into some of the cards I hadn't talked about previously, mainly the legendaries and my thoughts on those. And then a brief deck tech for Viscerai and where I'm starting there. I'm pretty hyped for three of the four rune blades that we have in CC now. Um, so Viscerai, Vincent, and Florian. Aurora, I'm gonna to leave to everybody else, but I'm not quite sure on the directions that I wanna go with Florian and Vincent yet, and I'm still tinkering around on some of the deck lists, but I have put together a little bit of a base for where I'm starting with Viscerai and some of my first thoughts. So uh, I'm gonna to touch on World Premiere, what we found out over that weekend. I'll talk about some of the legendaries and other cards uh, a little bit more and then we'll dive into the deck tech but yes amazing event this weekend just gone and man LSS hit us with a few uh, surprises to say the least so um, if some of you guys watched my previous video um, I did talk about the Japanese alt art heroes and how I thought they were going to be distributed got some things right something's wrong um we can start with what i got right it they are going to be given out at worlds as you will all well know now uh, the amount of market posts gone up about sponsoring people and bundles and this and that um, you can buy a souvenir bundle uh, as somebody that's attending the world championship and you will get one of each of the alt art japanese cards so they're not going to be as scarce as i thought but it is going to be a world, a world's exclusive. So, um, really, really cool. And we are getting another hero. And this is the big one. LSS announced that we are finally, and it makes sense on the fifth anniversary. I honestly don't know how I didn't guess it, but we are getting adult Ira. Absolutely epic. Ira was the first, the hero that started it all off with the demo decks. You can still get demo decks, uh, Ira demo decks, you know, from all stores across the world. Um, it's the first entry point into Flesh and Blood for a lot of people. And it makes sense that on their fifth anniversary, they're revisiting her. And it's kind of fitting that we're going to see her introduction into CC. The implications of which, I don't know, but... I do think it is a really cool time for that to happen, especially since the Ninja class got a rough time of it with the recent ban and restrictions and losing bonds and whatnot. The thing I like the most about Ira coming into CC is I feel like we're gonna see a return of one of my favorite styles of Ninja decks. In more recent times, they've been very, very heavily, heavily slanted to aggressive versions of the Ninja class. And the heroes really have sort of pushed it in that direction i'm a fair boomer and as i remember the ninja class i remember ninja control i remember ninja mid-range i remember builds leaning heavy on flick flax and defense reactions and whittling people down with their weapons with the option for these bigger combo spike turns and i think ira is going to do just that i think her ability getting one point each turn or each second attack on a turn really incentivizes you to take the game a little longer as you just get more points of value out of her ability that way. Um, the interaction with the Kadachis and specifically Needles is fantastic. Being able to go Pitcher Blue, Kadachi, uh, Kadachi for two or Needle for three depending on the matchup and whether you think you're going to hit see defense reactions on the other side into a one cost attack or simply Kadachi for one command and conquer for seven or amnesia for seven or weakest link for seven. Um, I, th I think that's going to be how she ends up playing out. 
with the ability to go a little bit wider, a little bit more aggressive, depending on how things line up. But really, really stoked. And that the Japanese old art era art is insane. I didn't know if there would be one that I liked as much as Viserai, but I do have to say, even though I'm not a ninja player, that old art era is something special. So all of you people out there who are going to be attending Worlds, buy one of those uh, souvenir packages if you can. I know they're pretty expensive, but I do think between the deck box and play mats and promos you might not be interested in, you can very easily get your money back and then you just get to keep whatever interests you the most. I think it is pretty good value and I'm, I really love what LSS have done there. So yeah, but anyway, I want to talk about Rosetta. That's what the world premiere was about. So uh, we're going to click over. We can go through the Rosetta set. I'll touch on a few more cards and then we'll deep dive into the Viscera deck tech. All right, so Rosetta, we know what we're getting. Um, I mean, we can touch on it a little bit. It's not a rune blade. I was hoping we'd get a sweet rune blade fabled, but we didn't. It's wizard, will of arcana, legendary, obviously, so you only get one. When this is pitched, amp one. What does this mean? Who knows, honestly. Amp one feels particularly more powerful than some of the other effects from fables, especially given that this is a blue pitch. So I could very easily see this being played um, in both the wizards from this set. But yeah, I don't know. I don't feel like any kind of way about it realistically. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it given that I know that I'm not gonna be playing it. Uh, but let's jump into some of the stuff more specific to what I want to be playing, okay, first one, Bark Skin of the Millennium Tree. So, Crown of Seeds, gone. They're not replacing the headpiece. Instead, they're giving us an Earth Equipment Chest, which actually makes sense with the way that Fab tend to approach this sort of thing. They, well, I should say LSS, they like to introduce key decision points so that when you choose to play an equipment, it's actually an interesting choice and a bit of a toss up, right? We have the Dyadic Carapace, which is the Temper 2 equipment that also has AB2, which is gonna be really, really strong in this format given that we've got wizards floating about. So this Earth equipment is already competing against a pretty good piece of equipment in Florian, but the upside of Bark Skin is pretty huge. So obviously we've got the standard temper two, which means at worst you're going to get three block value out of this. But whenever it defends, if there are four or more earth cards in your banish zone, create an embodiment of earth token, right? So that embodiment of earth doesn't really mean anything unless you're going to block other cards, but I think you're going to be blocking plenty in Florian. And that embodiment represents an additional point of value on non-attack actions. So if you can fulfill the four earth and banish requirement and you block with this plus a non-attack, um, let's say a, you're gonna wanna fill your deck with block three non-attacks, but uh, that means you're getting, the, on the first block, you're getting two, two block here plus four block from your non-attack because you've now made an embodiment of earth. So this was effect, the first block was effectively worth three. And then on the second block, you're only gonna get the one remaining plus again the embodiment of earth if you're blocking with one non-attack you're effectively getting two so at a base level you're only really going to want to block with this once it's turned on and you can pretty easily get five points of value out of this now that scales up if you're blocking with more cards or if florian is turned on when you block with the bark skin that means that you know that initial three actually becomes four you know, and that the, the second block obviously gets an additional point as well. And embodiments stick around so you can do a whole bunch of shenanigans in, in terms of having auras and sacking them off and bending things and, and whatnot. So really, really strong piece. Um, you're definitely gonna want it in any of your Florian builds against 
anything like Guardian or aggressive decks where you're going to be blocking with multiple cards and I, I think will lend itself more to the matchups where it's tending to go taller. I also love that they've printed something that's going to be competing with Find or Spring Tunic as well as I, it was just getting a little bit boring that Tunic just became the go-to chess piece for so many decks. So presenting more options at the chess slot that create interesting decisions feels great to me. Yeah, Barkskin and Millennium Tree, it's kind of reminds me a bit of Carrion Husk and I am all for it as there is zero downside and I plan on playing Earth. So yeah, Barkskin, great card, great, great card. And I will sort of say it like, Runeblade are spoilt in terms of the equipment suite. They might just have the best equipment suite in the game. Like at every position, like you just have unbelievable choices. Um, to bark skin uh i will talk about this majestic i'm not going to talk about all the majestics but plow under so two cost three block earth great um because at a base level this is an earth card that you can block with get three value out of and fill your graveyard comes in for two pretty poor but it has the same text as felling of the crown so if you meet that four card four earth cards and banish requirement this gets plus four so it becomes a two for six Pretty standard, and then the decomposability on this um, is the same as all other decomposers. So two, you banish two earth and an action from your graveyard. But if you do, each hero puts a card from their arsenal on the bottom of their deck. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So um, just more disruption available. I feel like Runeblade is kind of, you know, this is more specific to Florian, of course, but there's just a slew of on hits and disruption available at this point. So yeah, I think this card is great. Um, it's going to be one of the premier decomposed cards between this and Felling of the Crown. You've got six copies of decompose in your deck that isn't just about banishing. It's giving you relevant, you know, value um, against your opponent. So these are great. Uh, Earth's Embrace also quite cool. I don't know how good it's going to be. I think Florian is going to have some interesting choices in terms of what weapons he wants to play. If you want to go the Nebula Blade route, then obviously one cost go again actions are pretty good because you get to pitch a blue, play this, and then swing him for four with the Nebula Blade. But this Earth's Embrace doesn't really play into that play pattern as... At the beginning of the game phase, you're going to create an embodiment, but you won't have banished an earth card. So you're basically trading one card for the pump on Nebula Blade and an embodiment, which is like fine. It's not amazing. You kind of want to be pumping Nebula Blade in that situation as a freebie, right? Where you're not having to count that value. But um, Earth's Embrace, it's a little bit of whatever to me, to be honest. Nothing at the power level of like the plow or under and the felling a crown, but those are particularly good. So it makes sense. Um, what else have we got going on? Okay, we can talk about the lightning greaves. Again, I'm not really interested in Aurora that much, but I do find it interesting that obviously this is, competes in the leg slot. So for both Ocilio and Aurora, this is competing against really premium leg piece equipment already. Aurora already has spell late, Spellbound Creepers and Ocilio has um, Storm Striders. So Lightning Greaves, but it's a very, very strong card. So uh, you get the Battle Worn 1, which is interesting because you're going to guarantee one value out of this anyway. And it has Arcane Barrier. So obviously perfect for this upcoming metagame but this is where things get spicy so instant one resource destroy this instant card you play this turn get go again so for you guys that may not be aware of that interaction if an instant card playing an instant card doesn't use your action points right because you're playing it as an instant but if an instant card has go again it won't use an action point but when the go again resolves at the end of the chain link it will give you an action point. So you can back, basically bank a ton of action points and with this, so uh, as an example, the Blink from the original Tales of Varia set is a blue lightning instant that just says gain an action point. 
If you crack Lightning Greaves and then play Blink, you will gain the one action point from the Blink ability, and then go again on Resolve and you will gain an additional action point. So that Blink now netted you two action points. And seeing this card and that interaction, it now makes sense to me as to why they banned Tome of Finder, to be honest, because I can just see that both the Cilio and Aurora would, would get pretty silly if they just have access to Tome, one resource, draw two cards, when clearly they're going to be able to make a ton of action points. This card is very, very strong. There's going to be some silly things that you can do. And again, I really like that LSS have printed it in a slot that's competing against other powerful equipment. So you are forced to make some really interesting deck building decisions and considerations when choosing your equipment suite. So uh, really, really good. I won't touch too much on any of the other lightning stuff. Now, here we go. Okay. Face Purgatory. Uh, to start off with, the art is amazing and it comes in extended art cold foil, which I will definitely be getting my hands on. But this card, to me, seems bonkers. So it's a generic Runeblade equipment, which means it doesn't matter. Viscerai, Vincet. Aurora, Florian, whatever, they all get to access to this card as Blade Break 2. Pretty standard for headpiece equipment at this point if you compare it to Crown of Providence and, and Balance of Justice. Getting that two, you know, block value out of it. Um, even things like Flesh Bag and whatnot. So it's on rate there for headpiece equipment. But the ability, so when this defends together with an attack action and a non-attack action card, it's a very Runeblade-esque, the attacking hero discards a card and you draw a card. Like, when I read this card, I didn't even know, like, what to think. It's off the bat, it seems insane. But we can break it down a little bit more. So, obviously, ignoring the two block value you get out of this, to fulfill this requirement, you're having to use two cards, right? An attack action and a non-attack action. The requirement to meet one of each isn't really an issue because you're playing Runeblade and you know, unless you're Aurora where you're also having to find room to play instance, this isn't really an issue fulfilling this because you can just sort of hold it and you can only you can just block with it whenever it makes sense for you to do that. But you're spending two cards. Now, in spending those two cards, your opponent is discarding a card. So you're netting a card back there and you draw a card. So you're netting the second card back. So you're even on card economy there as long as you're, you are getting a card from your opponent. You're even on card, but you're up on block value. You've got five to, well, I guess it could be four, but five to six value with a block on and you replace those cards. The most interesting thing for me with this is um, obviously this lends to blocking out very tall attacks because if you can say, you know, block with two, three blocks and this, that's eight. It's, that's kind of what you want to be doing against guardian sized attacks. And the fact that this happens in the blocking step means that your opponent discards a card before they get to reactions. So this is fantastic against playing around cards like Pummel because very often we've all played against a Bravo or you know, Bravo player where they, you know, pitching, swing with an attack, they've got a card in hand and two resources up. It's kind of telegraphed, to be honest, what's coming next. Um, with this, if you've got the read, you can just block up. They discard that pummel or the card in hand. As a worst case, it wasn't the pummel, but you still get to eat that last card from them, which means no arsenal. And you draw a card really, really strong. In that same vein, no. I believe is going to be one of the premium, you know, tier one decks moving into the next format. And she's reaction heavy as well. So one of the ways she was able to, you know, push over the top was being able to present multiple attack reactions. And so to, to either push over your blocks or go, you know, taller than a defense reaction or to fulfill the requirements on some of her attacks, which required multiple attack reactions. This also be in being able to eat a card from the, your new opponent in the blocking step is 
it, it's just so good. I don't, I don't even know what else to say about this card. It feels like it's like flesh bag for room blades, right? Um, it plays so well into all the disruptive stuff that we've been talking about. We, we mentioned Ira, right? When your Ira opponent throws a seven power disruptive piece at you, you know, on the key turn where you need to prevent that, Face Purgatory is going to do it. it. It's just so, so strong. I honestly think this could be, end up being like the most powerful card that they've printed in this set. Um, which is saying something because Rosetta is, you know, pretty high up there on the power level. So yeah, Face Purgatory, it's a no-brainer in like almost every uh, Rune Blade hero that you're going to play. So really, really strong card. I will touch on some of these Majestics as well. Snuff Out. I mean, this is bonkers, right? One resource, three block, five power, already pretty good rate. And it's uh, when you hit, when this hits a hero, you may destroy an aura you control. If you do, they discard a card. I mean, this is like not just on hits. This is disruptive on hits. And we've seen in the last format with new how powerful effects like this can be. And this is so easy to turn on. Like, so for Viscerai, for instance, if you've played a non attack action prior to Snuff Out, and then you play Snuff Out, Viscerai will trigger before Snuff Out resolves. So it will make a rune chart. So in Viscerai, you almost will always have an aura to destroy to this ability. And we talked to, in say, something like Florian, we talked about bark, uh, bark skin. The Millennium Tree, the chest equipment. Um, if you have the snuff out in hand and you know you want to throw that next turn, you're actually able to. Well, no, I guess that wouldn't work. No, actually, scrap that. No, because you had the bark skin would. You'd obviously make the embodiment, but it would blow up on your turn. So that doesn't really work. This it, it's more actually this works better with Aurora than it does Florian because. You can make the embodiment of lightning, which you can blow up on your turn. So you can play this and then in response make the embodiment of lightning after the fact for the two resources if you have floating. Interesting. Okay, so this actually isn't as good in Florian as I thought it would be. Although obviously you can still have... Um, the random incantations and things floating about for this, or obviously rune chants that you've made. It's not as consistent as in Viscerai and as guaranteed, but yeah, it doesn't work with the bark skin in the way that I thought it might have just then. So, but it's still really, really good. I mean, relevant on hit, great card, machinations of dominion. I mean, this is people have said this is just this is more in skies, but as a three block, and it kind of is. But one thing that I do want to point out is this just says if you've played or created an aura this turn, it gets to go again. So the play pattern with Morin is that you used to be able to go in any rune blade, just go Morin and then play an attack, and it would have go again regardless of what happened from there. With this, you do need to have played or created an aura. So that same play pattern, for instance, if you go uh, Machinations into a rune blade attack, that attack's not going to have go again. Um, unless you're Viscerai, because Viscerai again would make the rune chart. But in something like Florian, this isn't giving that go again. Um, this feels like a card that's more specific to um, Vincet and Viscerai and has some applications in Aurora and is a bit more of a build around. If you want to play this card in Florian, which is pretty good because it is a three block. Um, non-attack action so it is going to be pumped with embodiment and you kind of want to have those in your deck uh, but it's a bit more of a build around and to get that guaranteed go again you're probably more you're, you're needing to play the cards that make the play the attack actions that make the auras themselves but still really good this is the spiciest thing so come to temptation so it has that rattle bones effect so if you've dealt arcane damage this turn you may play it as though it was an instant the next time a rune blade attack action card you control hits here this turn look at their hand and choose a card they discard it that is bonkers if you ever get that off the fact that it's not just a random discard you actually get to look at the hand and take the card you want is insane 
And with rune blades that are throwing around rune chants all the time, the ability to play this at instant speed is, you know, it's going to come around quite often. And at worst case scenario, it is a creepers option, right? As it has go again. So you can play this off creepers when you know something's going to hit, take a card, and then you're going to get the action point back. So really, really strong. It's a few more hoops, but yeah, I, I mean, what the heck have they done here? And then haunting rendition. So this is just a rune blade block. It's a full block, so pretty good value there. But the instant discard this prevent the next two damage that will be dealt to you this turn. So that's just any two damage, so it works in terms of combating arcane as well. And then the first time you prevent damage this way, create a rune chant. I mean, the implications of that are insane. In Florian, if he's turned on, obviously you would make two rune chants. Um, so you're getting the full value out of this regardless. And you get to split it up, offense and defense. Uh, for a hero like Vincette, this is insane because this card is can stop a breakpoint and you create a rune chart, which also basically becomes a resource. Um, so just haunting rend if so with Vincette as an example, if you haunting rendition prevent two and make the rune chant and you can block out whatever else and you just keep a two cost rune gate card in your hand then on your turn you just banish the card make the second rune chant and then throw six physical usually and two rune chants at your opponent like that's an obscene rate absolutely obscene that's eight on average it's going to be eight on the offensive right you have the two prevention from haunting rendition so that's 10 value and you get say the other two um three blocks so 16 value out of four cards it's like really really strong and you're not even jumping through many hoops so yeah again really really strong flexible card probably not going to be in every single matchup but that for at worst that just being able to block with this for four it's like so good um obviously you can't arsenal this unless you're playing crown of providence but um i don't see you getting in too many spots where you need to arsenal this card yeah it's so that's so it's so so strong um and one thing i do want to touch on is as well is a move to like a change in the cost curve for rune blade cards um i've mentioned nebula blade here a few times and just going down and looking at a lot of the cards so even contempt condemned slaughter which i'm not can probably play that much in CC, but just being your next rune blade attack, cost one. So blue pitch into condemn, swing nebula blade. Really, you know, that's fine. Uh, consuming volition, right? We already had, but it's a one cost. So being able to go something like more than to consuming into nebula blade, um, but now you have hit the high notes. So more. Of into hit the high notes into nebula blade is bonkers meet and greet which we already knew about and had um but then obviously yeah the snuff out which we talked about it's just they've they've added a few more pieces where before you weren't really able to bulk out um a core uh, you know the core of a deck in those one cost but now you definitely can and there's obviously a whole bunch of other pieces and I'm, i won't touch on some of these wizard things because i want to jump into uh the deck tech so uh oh yeah oh, i can't believe they've given us these in marvels as well my, my wallet is gonna uh, i'm gonna be opening my wallet up for this set i can just tell um okay so talked a little bit about some of that i want to show you guys this now <laughs> i've called this jund um uh, reference for you you guys that might have played magic um to me jun just means good stuff realistically which is where um i started with uh this viscerai deck you can see the main equipment uh pieces across the top so the carapace face purgatory grasp nobility blade and the spellbound creepers this is just the best of the best it's a ton of block value in these cards relevant abilities like grasp making room chance face purgatory spellbound creepers obviously is amazing and i was just talking about it but obviously the weapon of choice for me in this viscerai build is nebula blade and that's sort of where i wanted to start 
it's always been where I've wanted to start. This is obviously Viscerai's weapon, and it's always felt a little bit weird that he's never wanted to play it. Uh, obviously, the strength of Rosetta Thorn was the main reason. Um, but it feels like with this set, LSS have given us enough one-cost attacks that you actively want to play that make Nebula Blade viable. So, and that's really what builds out the core. So we can start here. I'll show you the one-cost attacks. So obviously we've got Consuming Volition, uh, hit the high notes, both blue and red, which this card is at, at its best in Viscerai, I believe, because when you go something like a Morv into hit the high notes, Viscerai's hero ability is going to create the aura, um, which is going to turn this on. So hit the high notes is particularly good because if you go pitcher more pitcher blue into hit the high notes, this is going to come in for six with an on hit, and then you're able to swing Nebula Blade for four plus an on hit, make a rune chant. Right, so that's three cards, ten at a base, potentially twelve if you get the on hits. So hit the high notes really really good, and then obviously the fact that it blocks three and even the blue is would come in for four, which is fine and you know it's even on rate i guess um but yeah then we've got meet and greet which is a bit of an all-star as well uh, presents an on hit itself snuff out which we talked about again in viscera this is probably going to be it's at its best because you're always going to have that aura to uh sacrifice for the discard then we've got spell blade strike this is just you know, represents five guaranteed um, value. And then in blues, I also have Vexing Malice. So the main game plan of this, this deck is going to go like a going in enabler. So we've got both the red and blue Morvrian Skies. And we have the Machinations of Dominion. Again, this is you're, with Viscerai, you're always basically going to be able to fulfill uh, the go again on this because Viscerai himself is going to make that aura um, and this has the actual relevant text of overpower so you're going to be able to push some of those on hits through more consistently. Um, so you've got nine go again enablers. So the plan is basically play these, swing a one cost attack and then swing Nebula Blade. That's the base. It's built around three card hit three card hands and there's no frostbites in the format so there's not really too much that can muck that up so you're able to block a card or two and then use three cards to swing back at baseline you're, you're kind of presenting one maybe two points above rate on most of your turns through doing that then we have some of the all-stars uh, obviously Mordred Tide is amazing and works already really, really well with some of the attacks that we've already talked about, about like Spellblade Strike or Meet and Greet with the on hit. But this is what's going to sort of push you over and above. Um, the card I think that you know works really, really well with this is the Malefic Incantation because this activates... Um, when you play an attack action, you're actually able to, if you have this on board, play the Mordra Tide, and then the Malefic Incantation is going to see that Mordra Tide and make two uh, rune chants, which wasn't something that worked with the original Runeblood Incantation, which is still in the deck, um, because this triggered on the action phase prior to you having played a Mordra Tide. So, yeah, this zero cost Malefic Incantation is great play with the Mordred Tide. It's also just another zero cost go again and you're going to get the in Viscera, you're going to get the extra value off that for his hero ability. You also then have something like Deadwood Dirge. So this allows you to go wide with the non-attacks. Um, this represents an additional rune chant from Viscera's ability, which importantly would trigger prior to this resolving. So if you've gone non-attack and then Deadwood Dirge, Viscera's ability is going to um, trigger, make a rune chant, then Deadwood Dirge would um, resolve and you're able to destroy the aura that Viscerai just made and make three more. If you've got a Mordred Tide active, that would be four. So um, really, really strong play. We just go Mordred Tide, Deadwood Dirge, 
and you're at four, you're actually at five rune chance, which is the same as what Read the Runes kind of did. Um, Revel on Rune Blood, Power Card. What's spicy here um, that we can talk about? Um, ah, yes. Okay, cool. I should touch on this. Um, I have the Rune Blade Incantation in the deck, even though it doesn't play along some of the same play patterns of Mordred Tide. It's a pretty, it's a fine two card hand that with the Nebula Blade, because you can set up for later turns where you just go pitch a blue Rune Blood Incantation and then swing Nebula Blade for four plus a potential on it, which felt like an okay inclusion, but it's probably the slot that I'm the most unsure about in the deck. Um, I will talk about my little pet combo that I like to make work if I can and it's sort of a baseline of what I sort of start with in most of my Runeblade decks um, as I just think it's kind of dope which is the Sonata Galaxia plus Looming Doom combo I've got two Sonatas and the Looming Doom there's two Sonatas in this list that sort of pushed me to want the incantations as it gave you six reasonable or is that you could go search with a Sonata and I do this deck does feel like it's going to make plenty of room chance where Sonata will often be free um, but the combo with Sonata Galaxia and Looming Doom is obviously if you're going much bigger so if you've played an attack say if you go more attack and then play something like a Revel in Runeblood which with Viscerai would make the one from Viscerai's ability plus the four, so you have five rune chance now active. Then you're going to attack again. So, uh, for instance, yeah, if you've if you've gone, I don't know. Depends on the cost curve and and what's gone before it. But uh, say you swing an attack again, and then you're able to go. Pitcher Blue, activate Spellbound Creepers, and play Sonata Galaxia with all the rune chart triggers, the five rune chart triggers on the stack. I should say, well, the rune chart layers active. Um, then Sonata Galaxia, you use the floating resource um, because you have five rune chants, so you're going to do X is three, so you need six, so you're going to going to pay one. And then you're going to go tutor up the one copy of Looming Doom, which will then resolve with the rune chant triggers still active. This Looming Doom will then eat the five rune chants and come into play with five counters. And because the rune chants had already triggered and those layers are on the stack already, um, that damage will still go through. So it will, you'll end up with a Looming Doom with five counters on it, and you'll still see the five rune chant individual pings go through. So you effectively get three value out of each of those rune chant triggers. But more importantly, Looming Doom is gonna trigger at your end phase and it's gonna deal an arcane, arcane damage in lots of two, which is really key because in most matchups with rune blades, people are gonna bring an AB1, and uh, which means then it can only prevent one of those. And because you need the Spellbound Creepers to be able to pull this off, um, Spellbound Creepers uh, says at the beginning of your end phase, destroy it unless you have dealt arcane damage. And Spellbound Creepers offers you the biggest ability to go wide and create these ridiculous turns. So if you have a Looming Doom with five counters on it dealing two, in most cases, that guarantees you being able to set up another Creepers turn within the next five turns because um, this will have one spellbind counter on it and your opponent's gonna be forced to take at least one of those that looming doom arcane damage, which means you're gonna fulfill the requirement to keep spellbound creepers around. So it's a little cute, but um, I do think, especially with the rune chart, rune chart generation that you can make here, it's really good into slower matchups as well, like Guardian um, and potentially even New. I really need to test that, but uh, 
it represents a lot of damage and you get a lot of value over the course of multiple turns and for the sake of three cards in your deck it's really really strong and one of the other upsides is looming doom is a blue card that blocks three that new cannot make use of so which is really really important it's the one weakness here i think is that you do need to play blues to play this deck in terms of fulfilling the the cost curve and nu does have access and the ability to play them just for instance like if they across the course of the game banish a more in skies and then hit a you know hit the high notes or a spell blade they'll be able to play out all of that stuff looming doom is just a blue that they can't really do anything with the same with the machinations and the become the arcanite is useless to them i have a few things in the sideboard obviously i think runic reclamation you know on hit destroy auras i think that's going to be important um moving forward um uh, at the one read the runes i generally would play one read the runes i don't like that it doesn't have go again but if you're starting i think it's or going first i think it's worth playing the read the runes because it's really strong if you see either the read or become the arc knight in your opening hand you're able to set up a bunch of rune chants uh rattle bones is really strong in combination with swarm and gloom veil and also blue pitch rattle bones get back a snuff out is a relevant two card hand it's a little bit low rate but represents an on hit so you're forcing um you're forcing the opponent to to actually interact with you um and then i have the succumb to temptation i think this is pretty strong but i need to test it out i th- i feel like it could end up being a little bit clunky but obviously the on hit discard a card is just so so relevant um i actually like this card in vincet a lot more where you can set up pushing through the arcane damage um but this might just be good enough to play i've got it in the sideboard for now for the match for the aggressive matchups um where i'm happy just to play this out as the action turn on this rise of hero ability and then uh play out one to two attacks and force interaction so yeah i mean this is the deck like i said this is week one deck tech uh this is where i'm at so far it's going to change a bunch i will put a link in the description to this deck uh, so you can test it out yourselves um i'll be making updates on the same link as well so you'll be able to sort of see where i go to from here uh but yeah i think viscerai could end up being the strongest rune blade um but we'll see i think this has a lot of promise um presents a lot of damage relevant on hits and disruption um has really high ceiling potential um and is super super consistent um oh, actually that's one thing i did miss the vexing malice blue i tried to find room for the red um but i like the combination of being again being able to present two arcane damage it's good for finishing off grindia games with the rattle bones which you'd bring out of the sideboard and i think vexing malice the two arcane damage is super super relevant to succumb temptation so being able to go pitch a blue vexing malice if you you deal an arcane damage right then they're incentivized not to block this and then if they pass and you're able to succumb temptation at instant speed gain your action point back they take one you discard a turn a card and then you still have the two resources off your blue pitch to swing nebula blade like that is kind of a blowout um because of that interaction maybe you need the red vexing malice as well um that might have been a miss in here but i kind of am, it probably would come in place of the consuming volition if anything and i'm pretty interested to see whether we can push this on hit um more consistently now that we have a few more pieces so we'll see um but that is a really cool interaction but yeah anyway that's the deck uh let me know what you think in the comments below again give it a run through um i'm really keen to to work on a few of these runeblade heroes so you'll see more deck text from me but until next time we'll catch you later guys